Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Dressing in the Future with me, your host, Data, where today we have a monstrous twid on the sandbox, a lot of sandbox stuff. It's going to be a long one. Go get a drink, go get some food, go do something. It's going to be a long one. First, before we get to all that, the Mass Effect armor bundle uh, collaboration is in the Everest store. In case you didn't already know, it uh, costs however much it costs, costs a lot of money. But they are giving away the ship, the ghost, and the sparrow away for free. So this is just a, hey, go look at the Eververse store because there's free stuff in there uh, moment. That's all this is. So go get the stuff. It's free. Very nice. Love that. Okay. Sandbox updates. We have quite a lot to talk about. We got PvE stuff to talk about. We got some PvP stuff to talk about. Um, so let's get into it. Threaded Spectre. The only reason I know that this is such a nightmare is because I actually stepped into Trials a, a couple weeks ago. And this is all I was faced with. It was just triple Hunter, Threaded Spectre, uh, spam, every single round, no guns, no nothing, just this. So this is, in my uh, experience, uh, torturing Trials right now. Absolutely torturing the players of Trials right now. Uh, you can create so many Threadlings. And not only can you create so many Threadlings, you can do it very often. And Threadlings are kind of annoying to kill. And if a Hunter puts this in, a, in the correct spot, they can use all the Threadlings. And they just push you at the same time as the Threadlings. And it's just incredibly overwhelming and annoying, and cringe, and uh, thanks, I hate it. So, what is Bungie doing about it? First off, they are reducing the class ability regeneration of Threaded Spectre while you have it equipped, like they do with Ensnaring Slam. So, it's gonna be longer in between Threaded Spectre activations, uh, so you can't spam it nearly as much. Great. Now, they did increase the detonation damage by 25% versus PvE combatants. Uh, there's a lot of talk in here with, um, yes, you're not going to be able to use Threaded Spectre nearly as often in PvE as a result, but we're making the times where you do get to use it in PvE much more impactful. It's going to hit harder. It's going to be just have a greater effect, which I think is okay to compensate. I would love for this to just affect, you know... PvP, where it's it's really the, the biggest problem as opposed to the whole game. Um, but, okay, what what can we do? I, I don't really know. Um, Threadlings were the other half of uh, Threaded Spectre's dominance uh, because Threadlings are just, I mean, they're, they're a little annoying to kill sometimes. And, I mean, more specifically with Hunter, it was just how many you could generate at once. You know, one Threadling grenade is, is not going to kill you. It's double Threadling grenade and a threaded specter proc that's really the big problem so um what is bungie doing about it uh here's what they're doing so they're making it so they're easier to shoot down and destroy because a lot of times you'll like you'll shoot at one you think you blow it up but then it doesn't actually blow up and these things deal enough damage enough little you know little dinky points of damage that you know all of a sudden you go from three shot to now two shot and that swings the entire tide of a fight, uh, just because we threw some threadlings around the corner, uh, and, and blew up a threaded specter. And, uh, now you just have an army coming at you. Um, so they also reduced, uh, the base damage versus enemy players, um, with threat of evolution. They also reduced it versus players. So, uh, base and with threat of evolution. Um, they were, all, there was also an issue where groups of threadlings were not reliably chain detonating was when one was destroyed. So you had to kill each one individually when normally they're just supposed to kind of like chain explode. So that's going to make them less effective. Um, and uh, what is this last one? Fixed an issue where threadlings sometimes did not play their non-damaging destructive destruction performance when destroyed by enemy fire, resulting in them appearing to blip out of existence. I've definitely seen that a couple of times. Um... So, okay. Uh, this is also going to affect Broodweaver because, I mean, Broodweaver, I, I don't think is nearly as much of a of an issue as, like, Threaded Spectre is, just that thing isolated. Um, so, they are pulling some buffs that they originally were going to put in Final Shape. They're pulling them forward to 
increase the power of the overall kit in roughly the same place, and that is coming in the form of Arcane Needle. Now, I don't know about you guys, but to me, Arcane Needle is incredibly fickle at that close to medium range. Like, close range, it's like you'll fling one and it'll just go right by their effing head or right by their body. It won't hit. You have to, like, sort of back up and make sure you're aiming it properly to flick it at them. Very annoying. So they're making it much more consistent to use in those ranges or against fast-moving targets. There's a whole swath of, uh, of buffs coming here. I'll let you read those. But essentially, for the people who are not numbers crazy, um, they're making it easier to use in the places where they've said they want it to be easier to use, which I think is very, very good because this ability is very fun to use. It is a very satisfying, like, animation to it. It's really fun to use, but you had to use it in just incredibly specific places. And also, with another buff that we're going to talk about, which is kind of a big deal, um, this is even better with uh, the, the thing that we're going to talk about. Um, another absolutely massive, massive update. There is currently a bug where... If you use, let me uh, have the right uh, windows open here. If you use Ember of Mercy, picking up a Fire Sprite grants restoration. That's pretty good. The problem is that it will uh, reset your restoration cooldown back down to the default if you have a timer that is longer than the default currently active. So essentially what the problem is, you stack up a bunch of restoration, it's at maximum duration, it's at 12 seconds, you accidentally touch a fire sprite, it drops down to two seconds, you don't realize that it happens, and then all of a sudden you're like, where did my restoration go? And this has been happening for an incredibly long time. No longer. Bungie has fixed this issue, fixed an issue where a maximum duration uh, where the maximum duration of restoration and radiant buffs was being incorrectly stored, resulting in their buff timers resetting to their initial duration instead of their maximum when the buff was reapplied. Thank you so much. This is going to open up some opportunities, uh, I think, for Solar Hunter to shine a little bit more. Warlocks, you, you kind of already had a good thing. You just had to play around this fact. Um, but... Either way, this is going to be uh, a, such a, a massive quality of life improvement for any one of these kinds of builds that anyone wants to run. Very, very happy that this bug is fixed. This also resolves, uh, resolves similar issues with shorter restoration sources like Sunspots with the Soul Invictus aspect. Um, we're all, they are also going to be adjusting both Ember of Empyrean and Ember of Mercy fragments because if they didn't tweak them, then this build with it not being broken, would just be absolutely ridiculous. Um, I still think it's going to be pretty ridiculous. Like, I think it's this this build is still going to absolutely, you know, be popular and be very, very good. Um, but they're making some very small tweaks to balance it out a little bit. So you actually have to try a little bit before you just have uh, a full duration restoration for the rest of your life, essentially. Um, so Ember of Mercy now extends your restoration duration by two seconds when a fire sprite is collected. If you don't already have restoration active, it gives you restoration with a two second duration. This is basically, I mean, the second part is literally what it did. This first part is now what it's supposed to be doing. Um, this is increased to three seconds while you have Ember of Solace equipped. Ember of Empyrean, which for those not in the loop, I'll get you the exact wording. Solar weapon or ability final blows extend the duration of a restoration and radiant effects applied to you. So previously it always gave you just four seconds flat no matter what. Now it depends on the strength of the target. So if you want to stack it up super, super high, you're going to need to kill a couple more enemies than you maybe have been used to killing to get this all the way up. Um, killing an, an elite or weaker combatant will result in less time added than in the game currently, but defeating a champion or stronger will give you an even greater extension. Um, I'm assuming this is going to be like maybe a one or two second uh, increase or something like that, as opposed to this four second duration extension. Um, but even with all of these changes... Uh, to Ember of Mercy and Ember of Empyrean. It's not even Ember of Mercy. I don't even really consider getting changes. It's more Empyrean. Um, this build is, the, the restoration build is still absolutely going to be uh, a, a build that exists in the game. Uh, I'm very, very happy to see this resolved finally. 
Uh, solar ability buffs. Titans, let's talk. I've been playing quite a lot of Consecration. It has been my build of the season. But there's a big reason why Consecration was not really getting used that much. And that's because uh, the other two aspects you have access to just work really, really well together. And they were part of the Bonk build, which only very recently got nerfed. And even then, the Bonk build is still absolutely good. Consecration just didn't really fit. And honestly, the only reason I'm using Consecration is because Pyrogale does a little something-something to Consecration. So they are buffing Consecration, like, basically across the board. Increase the travel dis distance of the initial ground follow uh, from 18 to 20 meters. Increase the height of the slam ground follow detonation by about 1 meter. This is big for trying to hit targets that are just a little bit higher in the air. Um, increase the travel distance of the ground slam follow from 16 to 20 meters. Increase the travel speed of the ground uh, of the slam ground follow from 16 to 24 meters per second. So that's traveling a lot, lot faster. Was that 50% faster? Um, love that for consecration. This damage is pretty good, and I still really like the build as it is right now with Pyrogale. I think it's a lot of fun. Um, but this is just gonna give some some nice quality of life improvements to consecration to make it a, a little more palatable you know, for people, because right now I don't think, I think people are still on the bonk train, even with the nerfs that it got, so try out some Consecration, try out my Pyrogale build that I, uh, that I posted in a video recently. Gunpowder Gamble, okay, so I, it would only recently dawned on me that I'm, like, one of very few people that actually uses Gunpowder Gamble. I thought everybody was using Gunpowder Gamble, because it's like, it's Gunpowder Gamble. Like, what's not to like about Gunpowder Gamble? The, like, to me, the other option was just like, oh, hooray, reload speed, cool. This is so engaging with my build. Gunpowder, I'm like the only person who uses Gunpowder Gamble, apparently. Um, but they're reducing the self-damage when you accidentally throw a Gunpowder Gamble grenade at your feet when you thought it was a healing grenade uh, from 144 to only now 80 damage. Um, it's not just that instance as well. It's all instances, but that's usually the number one where you just throw it at your feet and blow yourself up and don't pay attention. Um, so we might be not getting uh, clips like this anymore. Oh my God. But it'll hopefully push people towards using Gunpowder Gamble a little bit more because I think it's incredibly good. It's incredibly fun. Uh, so go use Gunpowder Gamble now that you're not going to blow yourself up. Weapons Sandbox. We're moving on. Patch, by the way, goes live on March 5th, which is about a little under three weeks from the release of this video. Sandbox for the weapons. What do we got? Um, we're going to start with some sort of like both. It's like PvE and PvP. And then we have a little bit of PvE. And then we're pretty heavy on the PvP. So I, if you want to check out after that, I'm not going to blame you. But there, there's some pretty significant stuff happening for PvP that if you engage with PvP in the slightest, you're probably going to want to hear uh, what's going on. Weapon archetypes. Heavy burst hand cannons. So that's uh, Warden's Law, for example. Um, corrected an issue that was causing heavy burst hand cannons to have 25% less aim assist than other hand cannons when hip firing or airborne on mouse and keyboard. Okay. I'm no longer nearly excited, as excited about this uh, than I was anticipating. Uh, I think Warden's Law on uh, keyboard and mouse is uh, just, it's it's okay. It, it was, I, I tried it. It was, it was okay. It was fine. It was nothing special to me. Uh, okay, when hip, I'm, when am I hip firing this? I'm never hip firing this thing. And when airborne, okay, I'll take the airborne, but all right. Now I'm not nearly as excited. Bows. They continue to be hard for some players to counter in PvP. Uh, they're they're quite, uh, quite. I don't want to say, I mean, I think they're annoying. But if you play PvP, you know what's up with bows. Um, they made them easier to use by making their fully drawn projectiles hit scan at longer distances, which makes them much more reliable at range. Uh, they're keeping the change, but they're making some aim assist uh, changes to give, uh, to make them require more skill to use at those longer ranges. So they reduce the auto aim fall off distance angle cone scaler uh, by uh, start and end by 15%. So aim assist is just gonna be less effective at long range, uh, translated into English. 
and reduced the maximum auto aim cone size by 5%. So they're harder to use at longer ranges. That's what they're saying. Okay. Uh, that's, it's, that's more of a problem for something like Wish Ender, which is getting an adjustment, by the way. Um, and maybe like Le Monarch users are also going to be uh, uh, sad about that. I'm personally not sad about bows getting slapped around a little bit because they are... Well, let's move on. Um, breakneck. Uh, they forgot to include target lock for Breakneck's uh, second trait column. So... In case you wanted something other than Onslaught, I, I, I guess. I don't know. Uh, scout rifles increased base damage by 5%. Lightweight scout rifles. They've suffered from being unforgiving when missing crits. We're making a change that reduces the proportion of crits required for optimal time to kill from four crits to three crits and one body. Not seeing a lot of scout rifle usage. Maybe this will have some impact somewhere, uh, but I, I don't envision this swinging the metagame. Uh, a considerable amount. Snipers, uh, still dis uh, disproportionately oppressive to play against, uh, particularly in 3v3 game modes. We're making them slightly harder to use by nerfing aim assist a little bit. Reduce the auto aim cone size by 10%. Again, I feel like I am so bad with snipers and Bungie is still like, they're still really good in these parts of the game. And I'm just like, I must be ass if like I still can't hit anything with a sniper on mouse and keyboard. Is this like is this like a controller thing? I'm I'm not sure, but like it just makes me feel worse about my ability when they're like, I can't hit anything with the sniper, and Bungie's like they're still really good, so we're gonna <laughs> nerf them more. I'm just like okay, so I should just give up on sniping then. Okay, cool. Rocket launcher meta has become more set than we'd like with adaptive and aggressive subfamilies outperforming the rest. This is mainly because IMO they fire at 25. RPM, whereas precision and high impact fire at 15 RPM. So you can get more rockets out faster. And generally speaking, um, by the time you're out of rockets with like adaptive and aggressive subfamilies, the the damage phase is over and you can just refill. Or the thing that you're shooting is dead. Like you don't even, it's, it's not around anymore. Um, so they're making adjustments to precision and high impact subfamilies that give them more reserve ammo as well as making other adjustments to give them some unique strengths. So precision, you're getting two uh, more rockets in reserve and reduce the damage penalty from minus 10 to minus 5%. Um, and high impact, they're also getting two rockets. Now deals more detonation damage and less impact for roughly the same total damage, making them more effective versus groups or when getting splash damage when you like just happen to uh, miss a target. This change also affects Deathbringer, Galahorn, and Truth. So precision and high impacts. Uh, let me bring up a dim here. Uh, so that's stuff like uh, Palmyra D. That's a precision frame. That's uh, Royal Entry. If you have one of those, that's a precision frame. Um... Hezen Vengeance, if you're still ha no, that's aggressive. Never mind. Um, yeah, anything that's like 15 RPM is is mainly what's uh, being affected here. So not Crux Termination, uh, that is an aggressive frame. Uh, Braytech Osprey, that's probably one of the newer ones. That's a high impact frame that can get some, you know, it can get some pretty decent rolls uh, if you don't manage to find your way into a uh, like a Cold Comfort, which is also an aggressive frame, or an Apex a Predator. Where's my apex? That's an adaptive, so that is not being adjusted. Uh, you know, but also it's a you know it's a raid weapon, so a little bit harder to access. So yeah, so I, those hunting down maybe like a Braytech Osprey, you know, people who can't you know they don't want to farm the dungeon, which I totally understand, uh, or maybe don't have access to Last Wish raid weapons or or anything like that. Braytech Osprey is is now a little bit more on the table for you. Um, so yeah, I think that's a that's a good change. I think it's a good change. Okay. Heavy GLs, they keep buffing them. People still ain't using them. I think they're, they're like, they've only just recently, I think, started to become a, like a little mainstream. Like, they're still very not mainstream. They're still very niche. But the fact that I've even seen them recently is a good sign. I think there's been a lot of, uh, like, solo warlord's ruin there's been like some usage there um and also with cataphract like i've seen a little bit of of heavy gl usage but it's still 
like like they like they're saying there's fairly strong mathematically like they're very close to rockets but it hasn't moved the needle so they're making even more changes they were pushing them more into sustained damage and add clear and they're also tweaking spike grenades to make them less of a dominant pick this is not a nerf to overall gl uh, damage output as we've increased impact and detonation damage to compensate and dramatically increased reserve ammunition so from a minimum of six to a maximum of 10 rounds they increased reserve ammo depending on just depends on the gl Reduced spike grenades impact buff from uh, 50% to 12.5%. With the below changes, this reduces the total spike grenades damage buff from about 8% to 3%, making them less mandatory. Sounds bad. Increased direct impact by 10% impact damage by 10%. Combined with the above change, this brings non-spike GLs uh, almost up to the level of spike GLs and very slightly reduces damage output with a spike GL. So Bungie does like to, uh, from time to time, take things that people feel are mandatory and just make them blanket into the game because they want you to be able to actually choose something different, right? I don't think that they, you know, want everyone to just automatically go to spike grenade for every single GL. Um, so instead, they're being like, look, if you still want to go spike grenade, we're going to give you a little bit of damage, but it's not going to be so impactful that you need to have it or you're not doing optimal DPS, which I think is, I think that's a, that's for the best, right? You want to be able to not feel like you're absolutely 100% locked to certain things, even though like in the grand scheme of the game, we kind of are. Um, but it, like anywhere, it just, it, like it makes farming for a cataphract that less painful. You know what I mean? Like instead of also having to get spike grenades, like if I don't have spike grenades, eh, it's not as big of a deal, right? It's not that, it's not that bad. Um, so kind of, kind of a nice thing for, for people who are still hunting one of those <coughs> like me. Increased detonation damage by uh, 5% in PVP. This is an offset by a reduction to detonation damage for no overall change. I think it's fine. It's fine. Um, I, I hope heavy GLs make it into the, into the world a little bit more. Um, it's just that like rockets are just still so, e they're still so easy to use and they're still top dog and people don't, they, they don't want to change their ways if they don't have to, you know what I mean? Like until GLs are like overwhelmingly better than rockets, I don't know how much they're going to really see play, even if they're the same, you know, there's still more risk of like missing a shot. You know, if you if you miss a few in a row, I guess this is kind of the same for rockets too. Though you, you miss a rocket, it's a, a very very huge impact versus missing like one GL shot. So I don't know. We'll, we'll see. We'll see. But grenade launchers even more buffs. Wave frame heavy GLs uh, have struggled to find an identity. I wonder why. With not enough ammo to really work for ad clear. Uh, and not as much single target damage as a standard GL. With these changes, they'll be able to compete with other grenade launchers, and it will be easier to land damage. So increase damage by 20% and increase the wave width by 40%. I, I like I think they're neat. I think wave frame heavy GLs are kind of neat. But yeah, like they you're not gonna use them for like boss DPS, right? We already have regular wave frames, and like if you're if you have a forbearance, it's like, do I really want to use a, a heavy grenade launcher a wave frame uh in my in my heavy slot probably not um so i i'm interested to see if this pushes the needle at all i i i'd be surprised if it did um but it, maybe just more for like regular gameplay you know what i mean maybe you'll see them a little bit more where there's not as strict of a loadout requirement uh you know you're 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 messing around in the coil right all right we'll throw on the heavy wave frame gl okay let's have some fun Caster swords are the only swords that have a range attack for now. Uh, and the trade-off for maintaining distance was damage. This reduction was more extreme than it needed to be. So we brought the heavy attack damage up to approach other swords while reducing the heavy attack energy cost to grant higher uptime on the projectile attack, reduced the cost from five to four ammo and increased heavy attack damage by 16%. Very good change. I know Bungie is very much of the mind that like the closer you are, or the closer you need to be with the thing, the more damage it should deal to kind of like compensate for the risk. But like caster swords were literally not getting any use at all. Um, and I know some people got like a Sola scar just like rotting in the vault. They came out with the with the new sword, um, Dragon Cult Sickle from the dungeon. As soon as I saw that, I was like, cool, another weapon to never use because caster swords are kind of not good. Um, so, okay, I'll take a little damage bump. 
All right. Maybe uh, yeah, actually have some fun with some caster swords because caster swords are really fun. It's just like, why am I using a caster sword when I can just use a regular sword, right? Okay, moving to exotics. Vigilance Wing. I haven't heard Vigilance Wing in forever. Already strong in PvP, hardly, uh, hard to control with that five round burst, so we've made that easier to compensate for. It now has a deterministic recoil pattern. Okay, I mean, Vigilance Wing. I, I haven't seen Vigilance Wing in a minute, but uh, I know its its recoil can be a little little janky. Vex Mythoclast Enjoyers. This is not, or this is not the adjustment that I think uh, people were hoping for. I think a lot of people wanted to go back to a to a 390. I still feel like it, it's, it's okay as a 360, but I know a lot of people wanted to go back to 390. Uh, anyway, uh, it fires like a high impact. Other high impacts have a larger aim down sights, damage fall off scaler. So they've increased Mythoclast. It uh, goes from 1.5 to 1.7. Uh, Wish Ender's True Sight is a big part of its ex exotic identity, so we want to retain that. But in its current form, it's far too useful in PvP. Yeah, it's basically wall hacks. And uh, with the bow changes from uh, from earlier, uh, not like earlier in this video, but like, you know, the, the uh, was a hit scan from super far range. Um, yeah, a bit too useful in PvP, especially with Oathkeeper, uh, where you can just literally... Where, where are the things? Where is everybody? Um, so... It will now deactivate if you leave ADS or you hold it longer than three seconds. To reactivate, you must fully redraw the bow. So that should hopefully cut down on some of the uptime on that uh, on that true sight. Uh, Edge of Actions Bubble. So this is the Titan Exotic Glaive. Uh, isn't intended to compete directly with Word of Dawn. And with the Glaive changes from Season of the Wish, we hit its health too hard. There's room to make it a lot more durable in PvE. Increase its damage resistance in PvE against all combatants except bosses to 85% and increase its damage resistance against bosses to 15%. Um, I, I'm not seeing a ton of Edge of Action. I, I think I've seen like a couple clips of some, some PvP stuff more than PvE. Okay, I'll, t I'll take a buff. Why not? Manticore. Lot of changes coming to Manticore. This is the SMG that uh, you know you shoot and you hover in the air. And uh, a part of the reason why airborne weapon, air airborne driven weapons don't really take off in PVE is because in higher end content you just kind of become a giant target in the air with absolutely no cover. And as easy as GMs have gotten, you still need some cover. So launching yourself into the air, not the greatest. And it also had some issues where like if you barely like if you tripped on a stair and, and you were you know, you accidentally hit aim down sight, you would just burn that entire thing. So they're making a lot of quality of life adjustments to Manticore. Um so here's what they're doing. Players must now be airborne for a half a second and deal damage with the weapon to activate the perk. This prevents accidental activation while running downstairs or doing small jumps. We gave it a special reload to quickly disengage anti-gravity thrusters. Swapping weapons will continue to disengage as well. Taraba also receives the special reload animation. While anti-grav thrusters are engaged, combatants will be less accurate when targeting the player, similar to the always-on-time Sparrow. I think this is the big thing right here. We need to see how less accurate they are when targeting the player. Um, but I'm interested... I'm interested. With the catalyst, final blows, and sustained damage with Manticore grant, uh, while airborne grants a void over shield and return ammo to the magazine. So we have a little more survivability in uh, the void over shield and killing targets. And we have a little more survivability where combatants will be less accurate when shooting at the target. Interesting. Very interesting. We'll, we'll see now. I'm, I'm willing to give it another chance. X Dearest. Um, players enjoyed the ex grenade launcher for delivering on the boomer night fantasy. I made a build video on this. Uh, wasn't hitting hard enough in PVE to be a top tier pick. Uh, so they're just increasing the damage. Uh, impact damage against PVE commands by 50%. That's impact damage. Detonation damage is unaffected. So it should be about a 20% increase. And they increase the maximum rate of fire by 17%. I mean, the, the build, the ex Deers build is fun. Like the moth mommy build. Uh, it's, it's pretty fun. I, I didn't think it was really enough to like swing the the meta game at all, especially in in end game content. But I'm also just kind of surprised that they're they're giving it some love. Like I it just kind of felt like one of those things. I was like, eh, it's a boomer night gun. You can mess around with it and you know Savathun Spire like whatever the hell you're doing. But yeah, I was I wasn't. I mean, I'll take it. It's, it's very nice. I'll take it. Makes that build a a a little bit better to use, and it's a fun build. All right, perks heal clip. 
was not as valuable to the activating players we wanted it to be. So now it's Cure X2 while giving Cure X1 to nearby allies. I've literally never used Heal Clip. I'm still probably literally never going to use Heal Clip. But at least it's better. Trench Barrel. Here's the big thing that I was talking about with the uh, with the Warlock melee. Um, can now be activated by dealing damage with ranged melee attacks. This is pretty substantial. Uh, right now, Trench Barrel can be a little annoying to activate. I know it's mainly used on, like, Arc Hunter right now. Um, at least that's the last time that I was using it. But being able to deal damage with a ranged melee is really big because it reduces the frustration of trying to reactivate Trench Barrel because sometimes like you got a big target moving around and your melees are just like not connecting. You're just melee whiffing. So now if you have some kind of a ranged melee, you can just flick it at the target. It's, it's much, uh, it's a much smoother experience. Um, so this is, this is pretty substantial for any sort of trench barrel based plays. Um, it was originally designed in a world where there were few ranged melees and it wasn't desirable uh, to make them even more valuable by allowing them to activate certain perks. We don't live in that world anymore, essentially. So they're opening it up. Barrel Constrictor was fairly experimental. I'll bring up the exact definition for you. Reduces pellet spread by 20% on weapon kills for a single shot within the next eight seconds, according to Community Research tab on Light GG. The actual uh, perk is called uh, is described as final blows with this weapon reduce the projectile spread of its next shot for a short duration. They shipped it in a constrained st uh, constrained state because it was experimental. They're removing some of those limits. Once activated, it no longer deactivates on, upon firing a shot. It lasts for seven and a half seconds and it buffs all shots fired during that time. Enhanced is eight and a half seconds. I've never used it. I don't really know anybody using it. Does this open up some opportunities? Potentially. But I, I know so little about this perk that I can't really give uh, more than that. Loose Change is a strong... PVE so, is strong in a PVE subclass build. Is it? Do you know what loose change does? Pop quiz. What does loose change do? Exactly. Nobody knows. What did it actually do? It gave you plus 50 reload whenever you applied a subclass 3.0 effect to an enemy. That's what it did. It's not particularly interesting for PVP. So we're adding some buffs to help with that. So now it gives 20 aim assist and 20% reduced ADS movement speed penalty in addition to the 50 reload, uh, plus 50 reload stat. Applying another debuff now refreshes the duration as well. Not going to move the needle in PvE literally at all. I don't know a single person using loose change. <sighs> PvP, maybe there are some fringe cases. Maybe. I've, ne I've literally never used it. I saw this perk and I've, I've deleted every weapon that I've ever seen with loose change. We'll see. Dual loader removed the reload speed penalty. Dual loader is where you load in uh, multiple shotgun shots at the same time, but they reduced your reload speed uh, to kind of compensate for that. Um, the wording also locked its shotguns when there are other continuous reload weapons in the game that already load more than one round at a time. Change the wording of the perk description to make it clear that it increases the number of shots reloaded. So now we can apply it to other weapon types without confusion in the future. Okay. Um, I, I mean, I always thought dual, dual loader was kind of okay. Um, but now they removed their reload speed penalty. So now it's like really, really okay. Massive needle mover. I mean, maybe for some sort of a trench barrel situation, eh, maybe potentially. Since we're shipping a couple of Tex Mechanica legendary weapons in the patch, we wanted to make, take another pass at the Origin trait. Uh, now grants plus 20 range and pl uh, plus 1.5 degree hip fire precision cone angle in addition to its other effects, making it easier to land follow-up crits with hip fire. I, what was, I think the only weapon that I used that was a Tex Mechanica weapon was the weapon from Spire of the Watcher, which name uh, escapes me at the moment. Uh, the, the Arc Scout Rifle. Long arm, it's long arm, aka the uh, the dead man's tail uh, wannabe wannabe weapon. 
That's the only one that I've used. I wasn't really a huge fan of it in in PvP when just Dead Man's existed, but eh, you know, okay, maybe maybe a little something here. Okay, Hake Breach Armaments Deconstruct and Sundering felt like they should work against more targets that looked like constructs or vehicles. So all of these are things that buff damage versus vehicles and constructs. So now they work against Void Souls, Strand Clones, Cabal Projection Shields, and Briggs. Briggs is probably the biggest one. Still not really going to use uh, any of them. There, there are not enough instances of vehicles and constructs in the game to get me to use uh, any any one of these things uh, pretty much ever. Uh, as an origin trait, Sundering has fairly high uptime in Warlord's Rune because of the number of eye turrets. However, a perk themed around breaking stuff feels like it could apply more broadly, and Shield Break is an obvious activator. It can now trigger on Shield Break in addition to final blows on vehicles and constructs. We added a, su a small reload speed scaler while reducing the charge rate uh, benefit to account for the higher uptime. Let's get you an exact definition of sundering because I know while I know it's vehicle related, I don't remember the exact wording. Destroying vehicles and constructs grants this weapon bonus reload speed and charge rate. Okay, so now it applies on shield break. So some, something we do actually engage with. So it, it makes it a now slightly enticing origin trait as opposed to being a nearly completely worthless origin trait. All right. Hatchling's a fun perk. Um, but weapons that can technically crit but are bad at it suffer from precision kills being the only activator. So now you can get a precision kill or three non-precision kills. I think that's pretty good. I'll take that. Target lock is a big reason why SMG popularity has remained high. Uh, so they are now activating it later in the magazine for SMGs. So at 20% of the magazine instead of 12.5% of the magazine. So the damage buff will swing primary weapon gunfights less often. We do have uh, a couple of nerfs coming into some premier perks in Envious Assassin and Bait and Switch. Uh, Envious Assassin's loop works well, but certain weapon types, the payoff was far too great for the amount of effort involved. For example, even with the large uh, buffs to drum grenade launcher reserves, it was possible to shove all your reserves into your magazine, making the, per the perk the best option by far. They're making it so it's not absolutely ridiculous because it, it, it could get, in certain cases, it could get pretty ridiculous. Each activation is now capped at 100% of magazine size instead of 150, and the maximum overflow is now three times the magazine size instead of four times. I know a lot of people probably just farmed a cataphract in order to get Envious Assassin on this thing. It's it's pretty good. I'm, I am a little surprised to see the nerf but I don't think it's completely unwarranted. Um, it's, I mean, and it's also still going to be like one of the best, right? Like you're still going to use Envious Assassin. It's just not as wild as it can be. Um, I'll, I'll live, I'll live. Bait and Switch, reduce damage bonus from 35 to 30%. Too strong in its current form, outpacing most other options, but it doesn't need a massive change. You're still going to use Bait and Switch. You're still going to use it. Um, one, two punch now correctly deactivates after dealing damage with a powered melee. So I know with strand Titan, you can get in two, uh, charged melee attacks with one, one, two punch activation. Now I'm not very familiar with the navigator tech that a lot of speedrunners use in order to just giga burst down bosses in their runs. Um, so it now correctly deactivates after dealing damage with the powered melee. Just to me, sounds like you can only use one charged melee uh, instead of being able to use two on like Banner uh, Strand Titan. I don't know the implications for this for the Navigator build, but I also don't think many of you are even using the Navigator build in the first place. So I'm gonna I'm gonna just let that one sit for a moment, and and we'll take a look after it comes into the patch. Deconstruct. Hooray. Updates to deconstruct. Wow, you shouldn't have. Updated the perk description to correctly state it pulls ammo from thin air, not reserves. Fixed a bug preventing the perk from triggering when shooting an enemy, uh, an enemy titan barricade, and similar targets. All right. Uh, bonus damage against mini bosses. Should have been part of boss spec, not major spec. We have updated these mods to correct that. Just a little update there. The future. We pulled a lot of balance changes from Final Shape. And Destiny 2 into the light into this coming update on March 5th. We'll still have another uh, small, we'll still have a number of small but exciting changes shipping in into the light, touching content many players haven't thought about in several years. Okay. 
Uh, we're uh, in Final Shape. We're rebalancing many weapon types in PVE, buffing underperforming weapons, and leaving most high performers untouched. Since we're looking at PVE weapon tuning anyway, over the course of the year of Final Shape, we'll be looking at weapon mods that feel mandatory, and we intend to make some changes that will increase player choice, particularly in PVE. So this is um, like spike grenades is essentially a, a, a small taste of maybe what they're trying to do down the road, which I, I think is okay. They, you know, they want people to not feel obligated to select certain things. They want you to be able to just pick the things that you think are interesting. Um, not necessarily because they're the meta pick or anything like that, or because a YouTuber told you to use them. Um, substantial changes to several of the least used exotics. Uh, and adjusting some perks, including a long requested change to Chill Clip, making it more valuable to use on slower firing weapons. So right now, Chill Clip is just a stand, like a flat amount of slow that you apply to a target, regardless of the weapon that you're using. I'm guessing it. Uh, they're making it scale based on the charge speed of the fusion rifle that you're using. So like Riptide is still probably going to take three shots uh, to activate Chill Clip, but something like. Um, the the one from Vow, which is escaping me right now, Deliverance. I didn't have to look it up. And then there's also the World Drop one, which is uh, Arvandil, which is the very slow firing one. Those will probably give a bit more slow, so it only takes like a couple of shots. That's what I'm assuming it's going to be, because that's what everyone's been begging for. So, and I think would be a very good change. Crucible. All right, this is the part where I imagine a lot of people are going to tune out, but it's pretty substantial stuff in here. How long are we? We're at 42 minutes. Oh, my God. Do I even include this? I, th I'm gonna, I think I'm going to keep this brief, and I'm going to let the PvP people talk about the PvP stuff. But essentially, what they're trying to do here is um, they're trying to sort of combine base crucible and checkmate together so the effects are not going to be like as substantial as checkmate but it's not going to be regular pvp anymore and that's going to be very divisive because i enjoy checkmate it's how i like to play the game a bit more there's not as much ability spam there's more focus on primary gunfights um but i know that there's a lot of people who do just enjoy the complete degeneracy that is base crucible at this time. So I do think it this on paper is going to be a bit divisive for a lot of people. Some of the notes in here I think are, are a pretty interesting read and I suggest you go read all of this on your own. But essentially uh, Bungie is trying to reintroduce uh, like high risk, high reward and low risk, low reward. Right now things are m more skewed towards high reward and not as much of a risk and they're also concerned about how good people have gotten over the years and how well people are able to execute on some of these types of kills unreadable kills that just feel like there was nothing that you could have done to prevent your death um and it also creates uh a situation where newer players are struggling to sort of enter uh the pvp world without you know, just being completely decimated by everyone who knows what they're doing. Um, they're putting a higher emphasis on crits and trying to not make it so optimal time to kill is like the norm essentially, because that's kind of what it feels like now. Uh, much higher per per percentage of our players can hit optimal time to kill with SMGs, peek and shoot with hand cannons uh, or blint with uh, wish ender today than could several years ago. Um, for example, high reward weapons like precision SMGs or aggressive hand cannons only requiring 67% critical kills uh, or hits to achieve optimal time to kill, um, which ender allowing you to swap from a bow to a uh, body shot with a hand cannon. So this leniency allows players to make mistakes and still benefit from the full strength of the playstyle. They're trying to reduce that potency, essentially. Um, so what's actually, I'm going to give you what's actually happening. I'm not going to go as deep because we're running super long already and I don't want to keep you here too much longer. Um, I'm going to just say what's actually going to be happening and uh, I'll let you engage with a, a more PVP centric YouTuber to get more notes on this. 
Player health will be increased by 30, uh, 30 HP in base crucible. So now you're going to have 100 health and 116 to 130 shields, depending on your resilience values. Um, ability cooldowns. 15% uh, penalty. Let's try that again. 15% penalty applied in crucible only to melee grenade and class ability. Super cooldowns now have a 20% penalty applied to them in crucible only. Ability damage. Increased base super damage by 31%, so you're still going to be able to one-shot. Increased base melee damage by 16%, you're still going to be able to do two melees to kill. Uh, arc flux grenade increased by 16%, so that's still going to be able to one-shot. So they don't want to change those aspects. They still want, like, two melees, and you're, you're super, you know, you throw one dawn blade and they're going to die. They don't really want to change that. They also want to maintain some same optimal time to kill times uh, with the current sandbox to place an emphasis... Uh, they want to place an emphasis on precision. Uh, all primary weapons except bows will have their critical hit damage increased. They're also going to reduce flinch dealt uh, by hand cannons as they were consistent outlier, even compared to other stuff. So pulses, autos, sidearms, scouts, critical hit damage going up. Hand cannons, uh, reduce flinch. SMGs, uh, increase critical hit damage. Uh, all, all of this is to kind of keep things somewhat the same. So you might be saying, like, why even increase HP in the first place then? Um... It gives Bungie far more granularity to balance our current and future sandbox elements, and it lets us decrease the relative lethality of multiple sandbox elements like grenades and body shot damage all at once and universally. So they're they're giving themselves a little bit more breathing room, essentially. Um, but they're still trying to keep things a little bit the same. Special ammo acquisition. They're moving the special ammo meter from Checkmate into the wider Crucible. So you're going to start every game with two kills worth of special ammo uh, for your chosen weapon. Two kills worth so that it scales properly. Instead of two kills worth of special ammo being granted every time you die and respawn, you will earn more ammo by filling up a special ammo meter with points given for doing stuff. And here's all the different values. I know this looks overwhelming, um, but that's because everything has to be tuned based on the mode that you're in. So like 3v3, there's not as many kills happening, so they need to increase how many points you get for a kill. Um, kills from special and, uh, heavy weapons don't give any points towards the meter. Jumping off the map will subtract progress. Ammo is not dropped on death and you will not lose the special ammo you've earned when you're defeated or revived. Earned special ammo will carry over in between rounds. Swapping from double primary to a special weapon will reset your meter. Um, to offset the increased health and to do increasing, uh, base damage of several special weapons. Again, they're still trying to keep things a little bit the same. Um, exotic weapons. My, my buddies were just talking about Crimson and it, the insane flinch that it does. They are very excited about Crimson reduced flinch. I don't play enough against Crimson to have an opinion on this, um, but they were very happy about this. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so we have some exotic weapon outliers, uh, that bypass the special ammo economy. Fighting Lion is probably the number one offender. Devil's Ruin is another offender. Um, the, the, the main worry with all of the special ammo stuff is that games might feel like first to special ammo wins. And it's definitely not going to be the case because it takes a while to get more special ammo. Like you can't use special to get special. So there is a slight snowball based concern, um, especially in smaller uh, or more intimate game modes like Trials where there's not as many people and there's much more direction in a game versus 6v6, which is just chaos insanity. Um, so I think that that was the main concern, but I think there are, there's just like so much happening here, even though it's still trying to feel mostly the same, that I don't really feel comfortable like saying like, yep, it's going to play like this. I, it's impossible, impossible to know. Um Again, I liked Checkmate, and I think, like, anything that Bungie can do to reduce the amount of just crazy ability spam in the Crucible is a good thing. So, like, I'm okay with this, I'm, but I know that there were a lot of people that did not like Checkmate. I don't know if they're going to like this sort of hybrid situation. There's also some other outliers in the Crucible. You know, Ward and Dawn, Well of Radiance are kind of uh, dominant right now. There's no mention of that. Um, but, I mean, this is not really, I guess, the place for it because this is more like an overall overarching kind of situation versus, like, we're focused on, you know, specific abilities. So more could be coming with that. Um, but I'm, I'm willing to give it a go. 
Um, yeah, special ammo, like, I, I was pretty okay with how special ammo was, was working right now. I think it gave you enough that, uh, yeah, like, I don't, I don't know. I, I was, I was mostly okay with special ammo as it is right now. Um, I'm worried that people might get, like, too bored with how much special ammo is coming in. So I could see a world where Bungie maybe increases the rate slightly of how uh, how much you get or how often you can get special ammo. This is all stuff that they can tweak. Um, so if it if it does end up being too slow, they can always speed it up. You know, kills or t at twenty three. If if they want it to be, uh, you only need four kills now. They bump it up to twenty six. Okay. Um, so I, I'm I'm interested to see how it plays out as a checkmate enjoyer. And as someone who hates just what the Crucible has become, which is just ability spam, every single engagement has a grenade or a melee or some kind of a thing happening, I liked that slightly slower checkmate pace. We're going to cut it there. Also, here's an emblem. Go get it. It's a pretty cool looking emblem. Um, and there's new Ever uh, Eververse items. All right, fine. Uh, you're playing on Multiplex for Trials. Or sorry, not multiplex. You're playing on dead cliffs. I think I saw a lot of people voting for multiplex, but you're playing on dead cliffs. Uh, oh, also, um, humble bundle and destiny. I think this is the cheapest I've seen everything on sale, pretty much ever. You're getting Forsaken pack. You're getting Shadowkeep. You're getting Beyond Light. You're getting the 30th anniversary. You're getting Witch Queen and Lightfall and Annual Pass which includes Ghost of the Deep and Warlord's Ruin and the Four Seasons, released during, 20, uh, during 2023, for 40 bucks. Now, I'm sure there's going to be some people that are like, well, Forsaken Package, Shadow Keep, Beyond Light should be free. And I agree. The uh, Forsaken Package shouldn't even be a thing. This should just be based in the game. Shadow Keep should just be based in the game. Beyond Light is pretty much, like, should be based in the game. But it's still the cheapest that I think I've seen this much stuff. All of this for 40 bucks. It's the best I've seen. So if there is a time you got a buddy that's like, I don't know, it's a little expensive to get in. If there's a time to hop in to, and, and you want to buy all this stuff, I this is the cheapest it's going to get until, I don't know, next year or something like that. I don't know. Not bad. Not bad. On top of that, 5% of all the proceeds going directly to the Bungie Foundation. Okay. Nice little, uh, nice little charity incentive there as well. I'm let you guys go. How long? 52 minutes. I might chop this down a little bit, but I am so sorry. This was a long one. I told you it was going to be a long one. Told you it was going to be a long one. So if you made it to the end, you're a crazy person. Thank you very much for watching this whole thing. And uh, I'm going to go give my voice a rest. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.